Chapter 298 After his return from the Empire Ajax's day-to-day -day life settles into a repetitive schedule of studying and training that is only interrupted by Delphs and the occasional party. He had a clear goal, the tournament, and this time his opponents will be the best of the best selected from people twice his age. Whereas Ajax's life got a lot simpler, the exact opposite is true for Judy, Alana, Elijah, Aurora, and Sylvia. Ajax's return from his months-long trip marked the end of their new noble protection. The reason for this was obvious, simple greed. While Ajax's exploits in the dungeon were considered a secret to protect, the massive influx of crystals along with the acquisition of not one but two of the Empire's exclusive transport worms was too much. Unlike Ajax's battles, when a merchant faction engaged in a fight it was usually stretched out over months as many small moves were being constantly made by one side than the next. It all started with a united front by most factions to make it hard for them to quickly make a profit on the new crystals they had just gotten for themselves. Fluffy reserving all the shadow-attuned ones for eating didn't help matters much either. For the first time in decades Elijah had started to see a quantitative increase in his experience gain as the casual game he used to play with most of his contacts turned serious at every negotiation. The only large faction to stay completely neutral in this affair was the Goldmancers. This trial by fire was a hallmark that all noble merchant companies that operated on a scale larger than a single city went through, if they survived, they were good enough to join the big leagues. Having a house be considered at that level, so soon after receiving their title, however was unusual. The first big challenge that House Hearthbound faced was finding a tamer to work with their newly acquired worms once they were sufficiently grown. While the worms' novelty made them a huge attraction, it also meant that only the higher level and skilled tamers could actually train them, a commodity that was easy for others to deny them. Elijah still had to physically restrain his eye from twitching every time he thought of the amount he paid for the tamer in the end. The other great change that the nobility as a whole had to deal with was first attempts at replicating Ajax's success when it comes to forcefully increasing stats. The exact method was being kept secret for as long as possible, so it hadn't yet been spread to the common populace, but Ajax was assured that it was only a matter of time in order to give their upcoming generation an edge over other kingdoms who would surely copy them once it was public knowledge. This particular change was met with mixed results from the nobility. While some were ecstatic to try out a way to get stronger, most of the children weren't pleased when told to wait five more years before spending their hard-earned points. The biggest reaction however came from the families that had their own coming-of-age traditions that now became impossible without spending the stat points. Another big change that came to the hearthbound house during the end of Ajax's second year was that both his brother's and Kate's mandatory service period came to an end and they took a much bigger step in not only building and training their combat and healing retainers but also leading them. Both of them gained a couple uncommon leadership skills. Over the course of his time in the academy, the biggest change for the family was still Ajax himself. While he had always been a bottomless pit when it came to grabbing mana-infused resources, but as he got more and more practice and his skills increased the bottomless pit started to give back. It had started off slow with the beginning of Ajax's third year in the academy as he became able to refund half of the cost of the materials he used in his alchemy experiments by selling the successes. By the end of the third year Ajax had gotten good enough that his work would break even every time. By the middle of his fourth year at the academy Ajax had finally gotten consistent enough that he was being headhunted as a delving alchemist. His extensive experience with crafting inside dungeons complemented by an ever-increasing track record of successes had more than one or two noble families offer Ajax expensive materials and a spot inside their delve slot in exchange for him crafting them stat potions. That wasn't to say that Ajax wasn't still emptying his house's coffers as during both the end of his second and third year, he raided the family vault in order to hire boosters so he could delve as far as he could in every single dungeon that existed inside the borders of the empire. Despite their individual growth, House Hearthbound was still one of the weakest noble houses in terms of actual power. The collectors were still their strongest retainers as they simply hadn't found any others that were stronger and they were willing to trust. Theron had also emulated his lord with his daily training and was actively closing the gap, 
getting closer and closer to being good enough to earn a permanent spot in the collector's lineup. One of the funnier changes that were seen throughout the years came in the form of Ajax's odds when it came to the end of the year tournament. Betting houses were giving insane odds for him to lose, but by his third year, his odds, given by betting on him to win the whole thing from the start, were less than a 10% extra on your money. The spectacle was interesting during the second year tournament, and it still got a few chuckles during the third year. By the fourth year tournament, the nobles had started complaining about Ajax, not only winning, but doing so effortlessly. More threatening being that he would be able to keep up this dominance for another seven more years. Do you really intend for the boy to represent us in the upcoming tournament? One of the dukes asked during the weekly meeting of the court. With the tournament approaching the king's announcement made a few years back has turned from a joke used to motivate a talented youth into reality, a reality not all nobles were ready to embrace. I have no issue with granting Baron Hearthbound one of our three spots for the tournament. The king said softly. Should you have a more worthy candidate I will give him the spot. What makes a candidate more worthy, another noble chimed in. The baron has already made substantial contributions to the kingdom. During the past five years Ajax had gained more than one or two supporters in the political arena. Even more surprisingly was the fact that his father was the one who did most the work in obtaining these supporters. Unlike everyone else in the family Sam wasn't talented enough or that dedicated to blacksmith that he could simply dive in it for the last five years. Instead, Sam had focused on keeping the family united and connected while they each did their own thing. During this time, he would invite one or two of the young nobles who were trying Ajax technique to visit and get a few tips from the source. All they have to do is beat Ajax in single combat, the king said looking to placate. A long moment of silence passed over the camp that objected to Ajax's participation. Much as they might not like him some rumors of how deep in the dungeon he was delving were starting to pop up here and there and they were terrifying. Your Highness, he is not even twenty-five years old. It would be seen as an insult. Seeing their main avenue of attack, cut off the nobles, tried another way. It may seem like it at first, but all doubt should be washed away after the first battle, the king's eldest son chimed it. What about the balance, another noble tried. Someone in their twenties even competing could damage the fragile balance we have now. The nations are more stable than they have ever been. The fear of war argument had been made plenty of times in the last few months as the departure drew near and it had never been successful, but they were running out of reasons. The elves need this win, everyone knows they are still hurting for gold after their last king. Is provoking them such a good idea? A new angle was brought forth, ignoring most of the other nations and focusing only on one. All our participants will be encouraged to trade away any winning to the elves in exchange for some benefits. The king wasn't placating here as his tone showed his decision was final. It seems like Baron Heathbound will be maintaining his spot as no challengers were put forward. Chapter 299 Ajax felt a deep sense of accomplishment as he looked towards the academy. Despite still being welcome to come in as his position had been that of a teaching assistant instead of a student Ajax knew that he probably won't be coming by all that often unless it was to scour the library for something specific. Looking back at the life he spent on earth and the one he spent here they felt like almost mirrors of themselves. Whereas his life on earth had started with him breezing through school without a care in the world before tragedy struck and the end of his high school and college days had been rough. Here his early life was spent always alone in training as his mature mind and young body didn't match properly for him to have a normal childhood. That all go fixed as his days in the academy had provided for him the college life experience he had missed out on during his time back on earth. He was now ready to take the next step as his life moved forward, he had a loving family that was counting on him, friends he could rely on, mentors he was hoping to one day surpass. His days at the academy had ended with him even having a girlfriend. The relationship between him and Lexi had an awkward start to say the least. Both of them had been dancing around each other whenever they interacted following their return from the empire. Ajax out of concern for his status and ability to maneuver in the political landscape and Lexi, because this was the first she had any such feelings towards another person. 
Who knows how long their little drama would have played out for if it hadn't been for Anna putting an end to at the start of their third year after Ajax returned from his first trip delving into the kingdom's less favorable dungeons. That wasn't to say that it had been smooth sailing from that point onward. While Ajax and Lexi had started being comfortable moving forward with their relationship into courting, Lexi's overprotective grandfather was not all that on board with the idea. It also didn't help that Ajax was spending at least two afternoons a week working with the man as they tried to further the research on magnetic mana. It had taken Duke Manashaper most of the third year to accept the relationship between the two fully but Ajax's respectful attitude and their attendance as a courting couple to the few parties Ajax did attend outside his training schedule meant that most of the nobility had accepted their courting. Despite his more active social life, most of Ajax's time had still been spent training and studying. Most of his family's gold income was spent on the same thing if he was honest, between the boosters who joined him for delves every summer and the few stat potions he needed that he couldn't yet create himself Ajax was a bottomless pit. His status sheet however showed all the work that he had put into it. Name, Ajax. Level, 51. Traits, Divine Witness, Baron. Each and every one of his skills had seen some measure of growth throughout the last few years. His focus on combat and alchemy could clearly be seen however as most other crafting skills had barely moved. His gathering skills had all seen some growth as he would always make sure to gather anything that the dungeon provided him on his delves. His combat skills however were the true winners. Despite the clear difference in the quality of his physical skills and his magic ones both saw tremendous growth over the past few years. His biggest achievement by far however had been the year and a half he had spent pushing, manipulate mana, and each of his rare mana aspects passed the level 50 barrier. Unlike, mana siphon, that presented many different upgrades his rare skills initially presented none, it took a lot of hard work to get, manipulate mana, to upgrade, increasing the amount of influence his intent had on how any spell he cast reacted. The mana aspects were all easier to upgrade as continued use eventually allowed all of them to get the increased potency upgrade that somewhat made up for the weakness that was inherent to his casting style. This change had actually made it so his rare affinities actually packed more of a punch than his epic ones until they would even the playing field. And both, Inject Mana, and, Enigma, were stuck on that same wall. Looking again at his raw stats Ajax noticed that his distribution had finally started to show as his vitality, mind, intellect, and wisdom pulled ahead of the rest they were getting 4 points every time he leveled. Strength and dexterity were sitting middle of the pack as they received 3 points for every level. His potion stats of endurance and perception were down at the bottom. Throughout the last few years Ajax had made sure to push each dungeon as far as he could, managing to gain the bonus from any floor where the mini-bosses were level 100 or lower. This resulted in him clearing an extra 24 floors spread across the kingdom's five dungeons. The final floors of each of the dungeons still sent shivers through Ajax when he thought about those battles. Each time he had taken enough boosting potions that in the aftermath of the fight his, poison resistance, got a good workout trying to oppose the weakness period that followed the boost. Are you ready, son? Ajax heard his father ask. All packed. Ajax confirmed as he showed off the spatial ring. Unlike their short delve trip to the Empire, this next outing would be made by a much larger group. The king himself was going to spectate the tournament and many people would be joining the massive envoy into Republic lands. Ajax's sister and grandparents were coming with him leaving his mother and Alana back home to keep everything running smoothly. A few different noble houses were sending entire retinues in support of the nine tournament participants. Unlike the previous short trip, this expedition was expected to last more than six months, it not only included the tournament, but also Ajax's delve into the Republic's main two dungeons. You best get going then, Lexi is probably already waiting for you, his father said. Much to both Ajax's and Lexi's joy, Duke Manashaper would be staying behind to run the academy as such the couple would be left with much less stern supervision on this trip and they were both looking to get more in that an hour or two stolen away here and there. Ajax hugged his father before he left, but as he moved to pull away, he felt his father squeeze a little harder. Do your best in the tournament, but don't risk your life, the prizes aren't worth it. 
Ajax knew what he meant, despite the tournament being a more friendly way to distribute resources during a time of war deaths during it were common. I'll be careful, I promise. Ajax said as he left his family estate. Chapter 300 While Ajax left his father at the estate as he was working on something, the rest of his family was either going to be joining him or were waiting to say goodbye at the convoy. Both Kate and Tom would be staying behind, Ajax's nephew wasn't yet old enough to travel and neither would handle being away from their only child for months at a time well. Ajax had taken a great interest in his nephew Jake. Not only did he want to give him as good of a head start as was possible, but he was also keeping a close eye on him to see if he was also a reincarnation like was. As much as Ajax knew that the chances of that were slim it wasn't something he was going to overlook. Being half-beast kin it wasn't that much of a surprise to Ajax when he noticed that Jake had managed to sense mana after he had been using it around the child for the first few years of his life. Ajax had taken to play with his nephew, in hopes of him unlocking as many skills as possible. There you are. Aurora scolded Ajax once he finally arrived. It's a good thing you don't take meetings all that often, your punctuality would be the nail in the coffin for our reputation. Much as Ajax wanted to refute that he knew very well how accurate the statement was. He would always get absorbed into one thing or another, his schedule was more of a guideline of where people could find him throughout the day than an accurate list of what he was doing. You be careful out there, his mother said as she crushed him in a hug. I know what happened last time you went into a foreign dungeon, so don't take any chances, and no going past level 100. Ajax was still kicking himself for leaving Lexi alone with his mother so early in their relationship. Lexi had spilled the beans on just how Oliver had tried to kill Anna in the dungeon and Ajax had been hearing about it to no end. The level 100 warning was a prudent one however. Once the monster level range passed, 100 the level jump between floors doubled, even worse it would happen even if it was by a single level, a dungeon with a 9 level jump between floors would go from a 87 to 92 floor straight to a 105 to 110. This big increase in floor ramp-up was why most nations didn't let people pass level 105 into dungeons, the reward was too small and the risk of something going wrong too high, especially when considering that all floors had a floor boss waiting to be unleashed. I'll be careful, I am only doing a single delve of each dungeon in the Republic and it will most likely be with some very high-level people going along for the ride. Ajax tried to placate her. Unlike most other nations the Republic was the only one to only have four dungeons, instead of five. Much like the other they had two high-step dungeons with 16 and 18 levels between floors, but also two very small step dungeons with the five and eight floor dungeons. We'll be sure to take care of him. Ajax's grandfather tried to help him, considering his usually silent nature a whole sentence was already him going above and beyond. Ajax's section of the convoy was the strangest by far, or it was more fair to say that his duties and his grandparents' section was the strangest as the worms belonged to them. The empire had only started distributing extremely limited amounts of worms to the other nations using Grinder as an intermediary about two months ago, so the king had requested that the hearthbound family bring both of their worms with them as it would add to the prestige. Ajax did have to admit that now that they were more grown the 200 feet long worms were quite the sight. Unlike their previous slimy and squishy nature, they had a tough layer of skin and a very flat back where goods could be loaded on. Despite the number of people going, the worms, going one after the other, made up a quarter of the length of the entire convoy. Bye-bye Uncle Ajax, by Aunt Judy Jake gave both of them a hug before returning to stand by Kate's side holding her arm. It wasn't even noon by the time the convoy departed. This however didn't mean that Ajax could just sit in a carriage and relax, like last time. He quickly left his sister and grandparents to worry about the cargo as he made his way over to the king's moving palace of a carriage. Your Majesty. Ajax bowed as he entered. Welcome Baron Hearthbound, take a seat, the king joyfully invited him inside. Despite the king's carriage looking like an unimpressive nine-foot sided cube on wheels from the outside with a few decorations placed around it the inside was easily ten times that big. 
Ajax had known about the carriage that came from a dungeon floor where the top level was 167, but it was still a very impressive sight. Despite being in the royal family for millennia, now no enchanter had figured out how it worked. Inside the carriage, about half of the tournament participants had already gathered. The members of the first squad we obviously inside, but so were quite a few members of the Steelblade family, including the patriarch himself. Ajax, take a seat. Benedict offered the open seat next to him and Ajax took it. Throughout their years at the academy Ajax had gotten along great with Benedict, even Xavier had become a lot more friendly once he stopped looking at Ajax as a potential rival, at least not for the time being. Baron Heathbound, I heard you were also participating. Benedict's cousin Richard greeted. Richard Steelblade had turned 48 earlier this year and was one of the deadliest fighters of the new generation. A person was considered an elite when their leveling speed by the time they turned 50 averaged one and a half levels a year, true geniuses approached the one and three quarters mark. As a level 78 was decently into that camp with most of his levels coming directly from combat. Lord Steelblade. Ajax nodded in return. Despite not having met Richard before today Ajax knew that there was nothing to worry about with him like there had been with Oliver. The Steelblade family's succession wasn't as tumultuous as the Goldmancers. Much like most members of the Steelblade family Richard was a combat nut. He specifically specialized in leading small elite strike squads and was a very versatile burst caster. He was also not someone Ajax was worried about when it came to the tournament, a glass cannon caster would be dangerous, but without the element of surprise Ajax was confident in keeping his distance and taking him out from range, while he used, mana siphon, to weaken his spells. Professor Silvertongue Ajax was surprised to see his previous boss also present in the carriage. Did you miss me, Ajax? Despite the pleasant and relaxed tone Ajax could help but give the professor a pitying look. Both of them knew that how Silvertongue had dragged Abbot Silvertongue into this due to his connection to Ajax, Benedict, Lexi, Anna, and Xavier who were all going but after six years being forced to teach Abbot wanted nothing more than to go back adventuring. I hadn't expected you to also be coming. Ajax replied honestly. The pristine poker face Abbot Silvertongue had on dropped for a moment at those words and an expression of helplessness showed for a moment. We finally got moving F. Father, the king's oldest son, came barreling into the carriage. He was dressed in his full heaviest runic gear that Ajax could help but marvel at. Despite having his own set of highly enchanted and improved gear set it was nothing compared to the former crown prince. He would also be one of the participants for the tournament, but he was going to be part of the unrestricted bracket, his style was the one Ajax was most looking forward to watching. Close the door and come in, your highness, the leader of the first squad said as the king was rubbing his bridge of his nose in an attempt to avoid facepalming at his son's actions. I'm not alone so that would be rude. With an obnoxious head gesture, the prince cleared the entrance and Archduke Goldmancer, Anna and Lexi entered the carriage. Your Majesty. They all greeted politely with a bow. Lexi quickly made her way to sit next to Ajax, and Anna and her father followed. Anna, because she wanted to sit next to her friends, and her father, because she wanted to seat next to Anna. Now that most of us are here, I think it's time to discuss why we are leaving four months before the tournament is set to begin, the king spoke once the door closed. Chapter 301 With the king's oldest son in attendance all of the main tournament participants were in the enchanted carriage. Only a single participant from the under level 100 was here, the other two choosing to stay in their own carriages, the king didn't much care as this didn't pertain to them as much. All three of the under 50-year-old participants were here however as this was mainly about them. This here is the peace treaty I signed decades ago when accepting the Republic's offer for peace, the king started. Many thought that I got the worse end of the bargain and there is a reason that I never made the treaty public. That reason is the opportunity we have now to fortify our future. As the king said this all of the participants were listening closely. Ajax, having already been promised to delve inside the Republic's dungeon, could guess what the intangible the king bargained for were. There are quite a few details, but it all boils down to this. 
we are allowed an almost full raid group to enter each of the Republic's four dungeons. The only restrictions on the group is that one of the participants is a booster, that they are under level 100, and that one of their people joins the group inside, the king explained. Half the carriage erupted at the news, despite the golden opportunity, most were in fact outraged at the fact that a spy would be sent along. Ajax's initial reaction was also one of rejection, his ingrained habit of hiding his ability rising back up. But after a moment that rejection diminished. His hard work over the last few years as he attended the academy had allowed him to reach a high enough level of power that he wasn't the easily removable target he had been before. Sure, there were plenty of people who would have no problem killing him, but doing so in a quick or quiet manner was no longer the case. More than that Ajax knew he wouldn't be able to hold back during the tournament and he didn't plan on it, so what if the Republic got a bit of a preview if it meant more dungeons to clear and more stats to gain? Silence, the king's oldest son didn't have to shout, the glowing locket around his neck amplified the word making everyone shut up. In all the years Ajax had known the eccentric prince, this was the first time he had seen him drop his usual jocking persona, in exchange for the veteran warrior he was. The 48 spots have already been assigned, my son has offered his services as the sole booster we will be sending, the king continued in a calm tone after the silence had settled. These individuals are the most promising talents, some of which have already managed to visit more foreign dungeons, and I am hoping will build stronger foundations than even our current champions. Much as he appreciated the words Ajax knew they were only partially true. It's true that doing this had been the king's initial plan when he signed the agreement, but his current actions weren't in line with the plan. In order to build the strongest foundation for a new generation of champions Ajax knew the king should have waited another few decades before chasing in. Nobody else besides Ajax and the royal family were aware of just how successful Ajax's method had been with the young nobles and the first batch that started practicing it when Ajax first published it were now turning 15 and spending their points. Before he had spent his points Ajax had managed to close in on getting 70 points in every single stat. Nobody has yet even come close, and most likely nobody would, but the general consensus was that almost all had managed an average of 40 in each stat with hard-working ones getting as high as 45. While that may not seem that high and increased on the average, the nobles would get of 17 in each stat by age 10 by 23 points. Even if one accounted for the 20 to 30 points nobles would get during the apprentice period it was still close to 150 more stats in total. The crown was now making plans to spread this out from high nobility to all nobility in the next decade and to all commoners within the next century. The reason the king wasn't waiting to prop up this upcoming generation with higher stats was simple, he was betting a lot on Ajax, how powerful he would become, how strong of a deterrent he would be, and what kind of leverage having someone like him will allow him to provide for the others following behind. The one regret Ajax had when it came to having shared his training method was the extra pressure it was placing on Anna. Unlike Benedict, who would have his father be the head of the house before him, or Lexi whose family head position didn't matter that much as they weren't landed dukes and their power came from the spells they had knowledge of. Anna would have to face pressure from experienced and older branch family as well as the next generation growing stronger from the extra stats. He was glad she was able to take advantage of an opportunity like this, to close the gap. These spots weren't sold, the king continued. Each of you have been awarded a position based on your reputation and feats. That said all of your spots have been insured by your families. This took Ajax, by surprise. He was the head of his house, no way something like that would go down without him being told. Even more so nobody from his family would accept the contract and then not tell him about it. He didn't know what was going on. What do you mean the spots are insured? The son and heir of a small baron asked. The man was in his fifties, though he didn't look older than his late twenties. His progress had come, managing to reach level 76, before turning 50. This despite his less than stellar family financial situation. Depending on your level each of you is expected to clear and gain the reward from one or two floors from the Republic more unfavorable dungeons and two or three from their main dungeon, the king continued. Boosting potions will be provided for you as will gear should you need it, 
but failing to earn the expected minimum would mean that your family will be charged for the full price for the slot you took up. This threat sobered up most of the youth present. The joy they had experienced moments before at gaining an opportunity that would bankrupt a discount for free was washed away with the cold knowledge that failing to show results meant their families would need to pay. The sole exception to this was Ajax, he now realized why he wasn't included. There was no chance he was going to stop with one, two, or even three floors. While some were looking to gain the stats from seven cleared dungeon floors to maybe ten, if they were lucky Ajax was hoping to get that many just from the main dungeon. The punishment conditions all, but didn't even apply to him. With that said, is there anything else of immediate concern? The king asked. A few of the youth had questions about how the expectations would be set, clearly expecting them to clear two floors from a dungeon with a 18-level jump would be suicidal for some of them depending on where on their current level fell in regards to the floor benchmark. Ajax ignored these questions, they simply didn't apply to him and he instead focused on Lexi leaning against him. With the meeting over about half of the nobles were getting ready to leave the royal carriage, Despite the opulence and comfort present here, it also came with the pressure of being in the presence of the king and some of them would rather relax their mind on their journey even if the trip was a bit more bumpy. One last warning before you leave. The king said as the first nobles neared the door. I know that some of you have your own views on things, and that is your right. For the duration of MY stay in the Republic, any of you who are found to be using any form of racial slurs will be unceremoniously sent back to our kingdom. This warning actually made Ajax frown. Not because it was in any way addressed to him, but because of the memories it brought up of the last few years. Despite most of his time during parties being taken up by his classmates as the head of a house, he had been expected to mingle with some of the older nobles on more than one occasion. It wasn't very often, but a few times during his discussions with some of the older and lower-ranked nobles that he had found out that some in the kingdom still held similar views to the empire rhetoric. He had learned enough about noble etiquette to not make a scene at the party, but he had quickly removed any dealings he or the rest of the family had with any of the nobles who made any views towards Kate or Jake. It only took a few months before his stance was widespread and nobody brought it up again around him, but even those few encounters left a bad taste in his mouth. Chapter 302 There was more than a little grumbling at the king's threat. While the majority of the kingdom had adapted over the decades since the peace treaty nobility tended to live for much longer. Even then the ones most resistant to the change were the old low-rank nobles who were already approaching their death at the age of only 300 years. They had been born into nobility, but didn't amount to much so thinking of the other races, as inferior, brought them up higher in their eyes. Ajax spent the majority of the trip swapping between his own carriage, the Goldmancer carriage that Lexi and Anna shared, and the king's mobile reception room. The first big revelation of the trip had been when they first arrived at a city. Despite having already been told that the Republic was a melting pot for the four humanoid races, the layout of the city took him completely by surprise. Unlike the usual fully stone buildings he had expected, the city was spread into three different areas. The first area was the usual stone housing Ajax was familiar with. This took up about a full half of the city. The more awe-inspiring half of the city was the sparse forest that took up the other half of the city, it was filled with massive trees that had their trunks hollowed out in order to provide housing. Even more surprising was that those trees were still alive, despite the dwellings that were carved inside them. The final part of the city was the dwarven undercity that sprawled out beneath both parts of the city, it was indigenous to see how the dwarven population had used the roots from the elven trees to secure their own habitat inside the city. We're only a few hours away from the first dungeon. Lexi said as they traveled through the elven part of the city taking in the odd nature-filled city. Despite the city basically being a sparse forest, it still very much had the foot traffic and ambience of the city. I think we will be delving into it tomorrow. Ajax nodded. We are simply waiting for whoever the other booster is to come. Who do you think it will be? Lexi asked. Ajax had thought this over many times, and there was only one clear answer. They'll send their champion. Ajax was sure of it. 
The stealth-based powerhouse was the perfect selection to both scout out new talent and ensure that no funny business is happening inside the dungeon. A very odd sight entered the pair's eyes as they turned the corner. A large worm with spide-like legs was wrapped around one of the housing trees. What are they doing? Lexi looked at the same time, both curious and a little worried. As it turns out the worm's ability to remain perfectly level is highly desirable when making delivery inside the woodland part of the city, especially so since they can easily deliver to any floor they need to without taking it up the stairs. Ajax explained. It took Judy about 30 minutes since we arrived to have four days' worth of work for the worms already fully booked. As much as Ajax was joking about his sister's mercantile nature, the truth wasn't very far off. The potential the worms represented was quickly shown off and then capitalized on. It wasn't just his sister that had been quick to do so, but his grandfather as well, most interestingly, they had gone as far as to auction off time slots, and this worked with a raging success. Oh sorry, excuse me sir. An elf with light brown hair murmured as she bumped into Ajax. She did her best to assume a submissive posture asking for forgiveness while extenuating her rather large bust before turning to walk away. She didn't get very far, however, as Ajax's had clamped onto her wrist like an iron manacle. My pouch, he said threateningly, now. The elf didn't waste any time producing a small pouch that barely held more than half a gold coin in silver and copper. The meek demeanor was gone however, she put up no resistance to him taking back his money, but instead of the usual apologetic tirade that came from pickpockets she just sneered back at him knowing he won't be taking this any further. As for the reason Ajax bothered with a coin pouch, the answer was very simple, Almost all street vendors had issues with young people that openly used a spatial storage item anywhere near their stalls. Ajax very much agreed with their logic, so he had taken to having a small pouch with a bit of money around. Since the pouch wasn't part of his regular outfit, however it stood out, and this wasn't the first pickpocket, he stopped today, and he knew it won't be the last. It still seems very odd to me every time I see it. Ajax complained to Lexi, not for the first time. It took me a bit to adapt to it, as well, but that's just how else are. Lexi said. Ajax wasn't talking about the attempted theft, instead he was talking about what he learned about the elven aging process. Apparently while elves had the same life expectancy as humans their bodies aged very differently, they would mature as normal until the age of 10, meaning they would look like an 18 to 20 year old back on earth. After that however, their bodies simply stopped aging until the final few years of life, where they aged all at once. The way to track an elf's age was by the color of their hair. At birth all elves had pristine snow-white hair. As they aged however, their hair would start turning more and more the same color as their eyes. While this made them very suited for physical builds, as they would essentially remain in their prime condition for most of their life, it did come with the disadvantage that their bodies were more suited to magical and hybrid paths than pure physical ones. The rest of the day proceed in much the same manner for the couple as they explored the city, their evening entertainment however was taken up by an urgent meeting inside the king's carriage. I do not know what gave you the impression I was not being serious, but I hope this is the only example I will need to make, the king see that as two of his guards held on to one of the barons. Referring to elves as knifeers on the first day since we arrived in the city, the king continued angrily. He was a thief, the baron defended himself. Would you have me give my coin pouch to a pickpocket? I would have you capture him and take him to the guards, the king snarled. Cut off his hand if you want to mete out justice yourself. The only things I commanded of you was no killing and no racial slurs. With that unpleasantness out the way we also asked you here to let you know that our other booster arrived earlier tonight. The king's oldest son changed the topic once the baron was escorted out, being sent back to the kingdom with his carriage and any people he brought with him. Who is it that they sent? The patriarch of House Steelblade asked. The shadow, despite the price all but whispering the words they carried though the entire room and pandemonium, descended. You can't be serious. You're expecting us to go into a dungeon with him? I am not going into a dungeon with a foreign master assassin. Enough. Unlike previously, the prince didn't use a skill to instantly silence the room, 
He recognized that their complaints were valid so he let them settle down on their own, but the decision was already made. This is the way it will be. I will be along with you to keep an eye on things, but anyone who wants to drop out of their spot can do so now, with no repercussions. Despite all the complaining and more than one fearful look from the selected delvers, not a single one volunteered to give up their spot. Giving up four foreign dungeon spots wasn't that easy, and everyone knew that some rewards were simply worth the risk. The chances that the elite assassin would actually do something were very small. Good. The prince said when he saw that nobody was complaining further. We will be leaving tomorrow morning after sunrise. With that the meeting was dispersed and Ajax exited the carriage and started to make his way towards the inn he had booked with Anna and Lexi coming with him. He had only made it a few steps outside the carriage before he felt, Enigma, activate. Unlike the other times it had activated throughout the day, Enigma was actually broken through for the first time in a while. Ajax was quick to turn and survey his surroundings, but despite his quick reaction, he couldn't find anything. What's going on? Lexi asked, also on high alert. Someone broke through, Enigma, Ajax answered. They didn't get my skills and my exact stat numbers but they got my level, name, age and even how my stat distribution presents. More than that, I don't have any idea who did it or where they did it from. That was quite rude of me, I apologize, all three of them jumped a little as a tall panther beast can materialized behind them. None of them had any idea how he got there. It was indeed rude, though I remember you letting me slide on more egregious offenses. The prince was out of the carriage with a smile on his face as he approached the beast kin, his eyes, however were on Ajax, silently asking if he was okay. You just couldn't wait until tomorrow, Shadow. Chapter 303 Ajax, POV It had been a good while since I had ever felt so vulnerable. From the looks of it, there was no real danger as the panther beast kin in front of us was the very champion that everyone was expecting to show up so in theory there was nothing to fear. Not only that but the information he had gathered wasn't all that valuable since I was more than willing to show what I was capable of in the upcoming dungeons and the tournament, I had thought I was strong enough to handle it. I couldn't follow the pleasantries between the two kingdom-level fighters as the prince and the beastkin were still having a casual conversation. While I had told both Lexi and Anna what happened to me, I left out a few things. First thing I left out was the process. Sure his identification skill only managed to get my name, age, level, and stat distribution. What I left out was that he got that on a casual use of his skill, Enigma, was good enough to give me feedback on how any battle with a skill targeting me went. If this person inspected me again and focused on getting my skills I knew he would get them. This meant a lot of things, but the clearest one of them all was that he had a legendary inspection skill. No doubt about it, a casual use left, Enigma, in the same state a rock leaves a window with a gaping hole and cracks throughout. Despite that crushing defeat I could feel that, Enigma, also finally broke through the bottleneck, soon I will have to make a decision on its advancement. The second big thing that happened was that I instinctively used, Inspector's eye, on him the moment he appeared. While he might have a legendary inspection skill his own privacy skill was clearly not in the same league. One of the most valuable things we had been taught as part of the academy, one that was still strictly kept away from commoners, was the difference in skill quality. The gaps between qualities were very different. The difference in power between a common skill and an uncommon one was big, this came at the price of breadth most easily exemplified with the weapon variations, swords, were common, short swords, long swords, great swords, were all uncommon. It could also be seen in the regular mana applications, farming, was common, and, mana farming, was uncommon, this despite the latter being included in the former. This meant that the difference in grade accounted for about 30 skill levels. The difference in power between an uncommon skill and a rare one was medium. The change being that with that jump in power, the skills recovered their wide breadth, swords master, and other such variations. The difference between such skills was about 20 skill levels. Between a rare and an epic skill the difference in power was small. What made the difference here was complexity. 
while rare skills had breadth they were simple in their execution usually only including one action, epic skills weren't that much stronger but each was more of a combination of actions. The difference in power here was only about 10 skill levels. Between epic and legendary, however, the gap was massive. Legendary skills got nothing except power over epic ones, but that power was overwhelming. It equated to about 45 skill levels. Now obviously when skipping more than one grade it wasn't a simple process of adding the average difference in power, for every grade you jumped past the first we were taught to decrease the gap by about five levels. That still meant that a common skill like, swords, would need to be 90 skill levels above, sword legend, in order to equal it. This didn't take into account the bottleneck bonuses, but it drove the point home. Name, Whisker Shadow Black Claw. Level, 209. Age, 679. Difficulty, Lethal. Traits, Blocked. Resources, Blocked. Stats, Blocked. Skills, Blocked. Whatever the champion's privacy skill was, I had managed to get some information on him. I wasn't sure what surprised me most, that such a deadly figure was called Whisker, that it was the first time I was seeing a situation where the system added a nickname to a person as a middle name of sorts. Or most likely the most important part, I finally laid eyes on a humanoid above level 200. You can also lay off me. The beastkin's words brought me back to the present. The kid might not have gotten as much as I did, but he also inspected me, color me surprised that he broke through. Being called a kid frustrated me a little, there were very few people who still called me that to my face. The only people who still used it were the king and the librarian. Then again, I suppose I couldn't get all too upset about it seeing as the person was close to 30 times my own age. Sorry about being so impatient, the beastkin was now addressing me directly. I just wanted to see you for myself, there is a wave of people who are starting to believe and depend on you, so I wanted to make my own opinion. People who would depend on me for what? I ask. To become my successor, of course, the beast can smirked, showing off a long sharp canine. Right now, it's just a bit of hope, but based on your track record, there is some legitimacy to it. Who knows in a couple of centuries when I'm truly past my prime, you might end up being the war deterrent. And like any good successor, you're on track to be a much better version of the original. How so? I ask. If I were to ask you, out of all the prodigies who are seen to be on the rise, which gets targeted for elimination the most? Shadow asked. Area Caster. My answer was instant, it had been drilled into us in every single class on war strategy, if the enemy has a talented area of effect caster, you don't let him grow even if you have to lose the battle, because he might cost you the war. Humph, <laughs> he chuckled slightly. That's certainly the correct answer. Stealth Prodigies, Assassins. Anna answered right after me. Point for the lady. Shadow nods to her. In times of war they have an equal ranking as both can swing the tide one way or the other. Area casters are openly touted as the priority because the nobles want the populace to look on them favorably. The reality is if an assassin prodigy ever springs up any kingdom will do their absolute best to keep them under wraps. The prince decided to explain it to all of us after activating one of his items to create a privacy bubble around us. Because if one manages to reach their prime like shadow, here it all but forces mutual assured destruction for their enemies. A good mage might kill half your army, but you can just send your ten best people after him and know you will kill him. If he is very strong, you make an alliance and have two or three kingdoms do the same. Shadow explained. Someone like me, however, if any kingdom managed to win the war against the Republic. My first move will be to sneak into their main dungeon and get as far as I can before going one floor higher and unleashing it all in the heart of their kingdom. We get hunted and killed off even in times of peace. It also doesn't help that the people in charge are sometimes selfish enough that they are willing to let a threat to the people live since they are safe, but an assassin could be a threat especially to them. Lexi chimed in. You're not wrong there. Shadow acknowledged. 
Which brings us back to you. Some people think that you have the potential to grow so powerful that you might be able to enforce the same peace I do without having to unleash a dungeon on a kingdom. I already know I need to watch my back. I answered. That was pretty obvious from your reaction to me. Shadow said. You seem to have your guard pretty high up, it's also not what I wanted to imply, I already know you know to look out for yourself. Then what are you implying? I asked. That there are people who are looking to examine you more closely than a person with 1000 perception, he said. But half of them, if not more, are looking at your character and personality. So long as you prove to them that you are peaceful and want to keep the peace they would be more than happy to help you get that power because they want to keep the peace. This wasn't something I had considered before. I knew that more than one noble in the kingdom was getting behind me as I will be a good war deterrent or asset. I had never considered however, that there might be nobles from other kingdoms who would be willing to help me just as long as they are assured I will be looking to keep the peace and not head to war. Chapter 304 Ajax slept a lot better that night after the conversation with Shadow. It led him to make a lot of realizations about who might be a potential ally. Of course his subconscious chose that exact night to prove just how wrong he could be. Two nightmares back to back where he was chased down by the dwarves and elves from their empire-equivalent kingdoms left him panting in cold sweat. Despite the bad dreams Ajax still managed to get enough sleep that he wasn't more than grumpy in the morning and he was definitely ready for the dungeon. An entire procession of the best young fighters in Grinder marched up to the dungeon that morning. With a floor jump of 16 Ajax was planning on clearing four floors. With the way the jump should play out the final boss was going to be the only challenge and he was only going to be a level 97. Not the biggest level difference he had taken on but definitely not something he was going to attempt without a temporary boost potion. Much like last time they did a dungeon, like this, the group started bleeding members as soon as they passed from one floor onto the next. With a high start of a full 50-man raid team the weaker members started being dropped off once they cleared their assigned floor, what was new was that there were four people besides the boosters that were going to try the floor instead of only a single one. This clearly must have been a special occasion that the dungeon didn't want Ajax to miss out on as the floor that spawned around them took all of them by surprise, not all for the same reason however. Much like how the dungeon had managed to create a Star Wars-themed floor before when Ajax was all alone, it had somehow decided that this floor will be a steampunk theme. The worst part was that Ajax hadn't even had a clue that the floor would end up like this, or that the dungeon could pull in things from his world into this new one. Unlike the sci-fi machines from Star Wars steam-powered machines are something that would actually do a lot better integrating in the technology of this medieval world, mainly because all steampunk does is turn water into energy which is a cheaper and more tedious way of turning mana into energy. What are these humanoids? Richard Steelblade asks as he takes in the sight of the sprawling steampunk city that took up the entire floor. Are they all infected by metal? Much like Ajax read in his sci-fi when he was young, Steampunk upgrades tended to slowly and methodically replace as much of their body as they could with working appendages. The constant hissing, caused by the numerous steam-based machineries, did no do a lot to put most of the party at ease. The prince and shadow were the most excited about the floor as they had never seen anything like it before and they had already started hunting for anything permanent that they could take out with them. Underestimating the brawler minibosses turned out to be a very big mistake. While they were all a lot slower than usual humanoid bosses would be at their level, their steampunk armor provided a turtle-like defense as well as a power-killer blow every time enough steam had built up. Neither of Ajax's other two tournament competitors had managed to kill a mini-boss. The prince had ended up intervening both times to ensure the survival of the boss T. All right, kid, you're up. Shadow nodded to Ajax. I expected you to call it quits after that last floor, but it seems like you are going all the way. The reason why they were taking turns fighting the mini-bosses they ran upon was simple. It was the most efficient way to manage downtime after having already used an enhancement potion. Ajax wasted no time chugging a potion of his own. His entire body felt so light and responsive all of a sudden. His brain worked overtime catching each and every small twitch of all the other people around him. 
Both of his competitors looked like death and Ajax was finally ready for combat. Ajax's opening move might be a controversial one as he had never done this before. Instead of infusing his arrow with a strong penetrative force that he knew had next to no chance of hitting it. No, he had infused the arrow with as much cold mana as he could manage. The effects of the arrow were immediate as the holder was covered in a small sheet of snow that was already melting off, the steel engine had dropped its high temperature and the pressure powering the boss's armor was starting to run low. Without the pressure there the armor stopped being as effective in aiding its wearer to fight others. The strong defense it provided was still there and not to be underestimated, but without a high amount of steam his speed was almost non-existent. Unfortunately, the humanoid was still strong enough to ruin Ajax's day if he played around too much and his potion ran out and he entered the weakening period. The fight was by no means easy, but it did turn out rather simple. Ajax's chosen method of winning was death by a thousand curts, and he slowly cut deeper and in more dangerous places as he was simply keeping up the pressure until he ran out of blood. How did you do that? His competitors were still picking their jaws off the ground as the fight ended. I simply made his armor as useless as I could. Ajax replied. What followed was a two-hour conversation on the state's water can be found in and any way to exploit it. Despite the quick and rushed lesson, everyone remaining knew that the secret to beating the humanoids was to cool down their exotic armor, rendering it dead weight. It took Ajax another two hours to get past the backlash of the potion he used. Unlike him, his two competitors didn't look all that well as they were forced to take a second potion when they tried for the second time. The backlash compounded with such potions, so even drinking only two granted rather debilitating fatigue. Walking through the final arch and passing the level 100 monsters Ajax made sure not to step away from the arch. Both boosters would be clearing this following floor themselves, and Ajax very much intended to be long gone by then. You did very well. Shadow congratulated him. That was four floors just here. I am almost afraid to let you go through our main seeing how many stats that would gain you. You will definitely make quite the showing at the tournament. Are you looking to back out of the deal? The prince was quick to pounce on the topic. Not at all. Shadow says with a shake of his head. I think I will find the experience a motivational one. Ajax didn't stay to listen to them bicker, as soon as he swiped the increase in stats by one from clearing the floor he was quick to back out. He knew these monsters would be way out of his range in terms of what he can deal with. He is definitely something. Shadow says once he and the prince are the only ones left as they look to kill the entire floor to ensure nothing too powerful is released outside. Any chance he is prejudiced towards other races? Shadow continued to ask. No, the prince responded as the two were methodically smashing through each monsters as it got in their way. Of what makes you so sure, he asked. Because his brother's wife is a feline beast kin and his niece is also part beast kin. I'm not going to lie, a lot of people are going to be happy to hear that. Shadow let out another sigh of relief. The Empire was thrilled. The prince threw it out there. I am looking forward to seeing how the elves react to him. Shadow smirked. I can see however why you decided to go through the dungeon first, even as strong as he is right now, I still think he has a bit to go until he can stand up against the Ice Princess. Who knows maybe those extra stats would be enough. Chapter 305 What's our next stop? Ajax asked once he entered the carriage of the Goldmancer family. All of the guards knew he had a standing invitation so he didn't have to bother with formalities. The initial plan was to head straight to the other, lesser dungeon, the whole plan was to get them out of the way so that we would get as much time as possible in the capital for all of the politics. Archduke Goldmancer answered. From your wording, I am guessing that changed? Ajax asked a little worried about what could cause a change of plans. Your unique semi-final floor is to blame for that, the T- dot, the Archduke was quickly cut off by his own daughter. You, the prince and the champion, pulled out someone of a kind collection pieces. Anna cut in swiftly with a dull tone but an accusing glare at her father. Everyone that got their hands on one and is looking to sell it asked for an audience with the king to change our route so we pass through Dark Cavern. 
Ajax knew that despite the Republic being a full melting pot, there were still a few cities that weren't as inclusive in their architecture. Dark Cavern was a fully dwarven city that was built upon an old giant ant colony tunnel structure. While it wasn't on the other side of the kingdom it was pretty out of the way for them. What is in Dark Cavern? Ajax asked. Their sentry auction. Lexi provided. The plan is to sell a few in the auction, to build up their price for when they will sell them around the tournament. Now that he thought about it Ajax had heard both his grandfather and sister mention Dark Cavern more than once or twice in their recent plotting, so it did make sense. After all of the 67 total pieces of steampunk gear that were recovered from the dungeon Ajax had managed to claim 15 of them just from stumbling onto them inside what looked to be a golem assembly plant. Both the prince and shadow had collected a lot more from the defeated enemies as they all but cleared out the floor with 23 and 28 respectively, a single piece was taken by one of the other people who had joined them on the floor. The big difference was that all of Ajax's pieces were in pristine condition, while most of the others were damaged in some way from the fight to kill their users. I'm not surprised if that's what's going down there. Ajax said. I've never seen such a predatory look on my sister's face since she saw the worms we brought back from the Empire. Did you manage to snag any of them cheap? We got our hands on ten of them. The Archduke replied. Since the run had been a boost, none of the boosters were allowed to keep anything they got from the delve, they had to sell them to the highest bidder from the people who participated in the run. While this may have meant that the prince could sell most of them to the royal family through Xavier's participation, he still had to spread a few around along with Shadow as a sign of good faith. Ajax was under no such restriction. Your performance was quite something once you showed what you had. Lexi giggled as she teased him. Ajax had been very quick on the uptake when the loot show, and tell, was done. It had taken him two seconds of feeling every merchant's skill land on the weakest link in the group before he loudly and repeatedly declared that I will be having these appraised and handled by my grandfather as the head merchant of my house. Not even his grandfather could get away with keeping all of them, but he could get a much better deal and save Ajax the headache. Your grandfather did admirably, managed to hold on to all but three pieces without building up too much resentment, the Archduke complimented. Though he could have done without losing the full leg prosthetic. Considering that this was coming from the best merchant the kingdom had to offer Ajax took it as high praise. Sure, the leg was a rather interesting piece, but the two arm prosthetics he had held on to were fully functional limb replacements, and since they were around level 97 they were the next best thing after limb regrowth available. Seeing as the arms he kept actually work, I think he did pretty well. Ajax responded with a smirk. You know how these work? Lexi exclaimed as she pulled the aforementioned leg prosthetic out of her spatial ring. She also wasn't the only one to focus on him at that. I know how to get them to work, not how they work. While Ajax knew the basic principles of steampunk, he was no inventor. Much more in the way that knowing how to swing a sword doesn't make you a blacksmith. A privacy enchantment was activated and the outside world fell away from the carriage. Would you mind giving us a demonstration? The Archduke asked, a predatory gleam in his eye. Sure. Ajax said as he took the leg from Lexi. The hard part is getting them properly attached. Ajax explained as he topped up the water canister. Pressing a button on the leg started the boiling process and heated up the water. Ajax had no idea where the energy for that came from, but it was done by the adjustment the system made to the steampunk idea when it brought it over. You see while the leg looks like a normal leg it has much more limited options of movement, but they come with a greater range. Ajax demonstrated as he showed that the knee and ankle were the only joints on the leg, followed by showing that they could fully rotate, the hip attachment was rigid. That and the nerve connections are pretty tricky. The medical industry had discovered that the human body operated based on electricity from the prevalence of lightning mages throughout history, the small currents that ran from the brain to get muscles to move were already well known. Using his lightning mana Ajax gently applied some to the sensors at the top of the leg once the steam started pumping the machine. The leg jerked in his hand at that and on its own rotated, fully slamming into the side of the carriage with a loud thump, leaving behind a dent. 
Not strong enough to do any serious damage to an archduke's carriage, but certainly not harmless. That does seem like it will take some getting used to, the archduke looked wide-eyed at the leg and the dent. It also seems like quite the addition and surprise for any mage to have. The archduke wasn't wrong there, without the help of full body movement even the level 97 equipment could only output a level 80's raw power it was a hell of a surprise for a mage to suddenly spring a level 80 physical build level of melee combat. The only question is when should we do a live demonstration, the archduke mumbled lost in his own world as he calculated market fluctuations all over again with the new variable. What does he mean? Ajax asks. He is wondering if we should keep the secret a bit longer and only show it in the capital or if we should reveal how they work in Dark Cavern. Anna let out an exhausted sigh. Let's go tell your grandfather about this, since he will want to know. My dad is going to be at it for a while. He should know that not all of them would be functional. Ajax mentioned offhand as he made to stand up. What now? Both daughter and father quickly focused on him. They might be high-level equipment, but the insides are fragile. Ajax explained. I got mine raiding a spare parts armory, but the others, the prince and the champion, took them off the bodies they killed. They weren't going all out, but I wouldn't accuse them of being gentle, wouldn't surprise me if half of theirs don't work as intended anymore. Let's keep that between us for now shall we? Anna got a sneaky look in her eye. I might want to go see what pieces I might be able to trade with the others. Try to find out how many working ones there are, the Archduke asked her as he got back into his calculations. My lady, did something happen? The Archduke's right-hand man asked as Anna, Lexi, and Ajax exited the carriage. Despite the privacy enchantment someone sitting on the carriage would have felt the impact from the leg. Dad just found a new variable. Anna said nonchalantly, and the guard simply nodded as he looked inside the carriage, before the door closed. Yes, that will be a few hours, he spoke from experience. Ajax spent the remainder of the trip to Dark Cavern with his grandfather and sister. They had first put him to work trying to find out how much he could figure out about their merchandise before keeping an eye on him to make sure the information didn't spread any further. You do know I can keep a secret. Ajax complained on the third day of being under strict watch. We weren't even the first people you told about this. Ajax had nothing to say to his sister's retort, so he silently decided to just try and sleep. The beds installed on the worms were some of the most comfortable in the entire convoy as they didn't sway at all. Chapter 306 Dark Cavern's layout was very different from any other city Ajax had seen. Having first been a giant ant hive it made perfect sense that its topside landscape would look like a small hill filled with holes, there were a few human houses dotted around, but it mostly looked like two or three villages surrounded by holes. The underground, however was a much more expansive series of tunnels that rivaled even the dwarven capital in structure if not in size. The convoy made good time as it managed to arrive an entire two days before the auction, giving everyone time to add whatever steampunk item they wanted to the festivities. Which one do you think we should put up for sale? Elijah asked Ajax. Come on now, don't pout. Judy poked Ajax in the side as he remained silent at the question. Three whole days you kept me in here. Ajax complained though he wasn't all that upset as Lexi and Anna just changed to spending most of their time in this carriage instead. But fine, I'd say you should sell this. The piece Ajax selected was part of a half mask that covered one eye. It was the smallest of all the items he had collected but also the most technologically advanced as evidenced from the eye it sported. Does that one not work? his grandfather asked. It does seem to work, but that's not the issue with it. Ajax responded. The problem with all of them is that we don't know how to attach them and that will take some trial and error. Doing so with hands, arms, legs, even shoulder and back armor isn't all that dangerous, if the connections are implanted incorrectly all you do is remove them, heal up and retry. The same could be done with the eye. Judy said. The person that will be getting it would be blind in that eye already anyway. Yeah, but the optic nerve is too close to the brain for comfort. Ajax pointed out. 
You make a mistake connecting it, you might hit the brain and just kill the person, as far as I know there is no healing that. So the mask goes, his grandfather agreed with that logic, especially since they, and Duke Goldmancer, decided to keep their functionally secret until they got to the capital. Too bad it's so risky, it seems to have a filtration system. Ajax let out a sigh. How do you mean? Judy asked. The mask covers the mouth and nose so it has to let air enter. It also seems to be filtrating it when it is powered up. I am not sure just how many types of poisonous or deadly fumes it would keep out, but I think a few of them at least. Ajax answered. Any way we can separate the mask into the eye and the lower face cover, his grandfather was quick to look for ideas. Maybe? Ajax answered with a shrug. But I don't know how we would do it, and you might just ruin both if you try. At worst, you could just not connect the eye at all, and just have it sit in the socket, and you can use the filtration part. All right, come on then, his grandfather nodded. You're coming with us to add it to the auction, and after that you can go explore the city. Why do you need me to come with you? Ajax asked. Because you collected them, you can vouch for their uniqueness, or at least their source, under a truth stone, that will increase the value. Judy explained. The three of them weren't the first to show up at the auction house, already there were four other nobles in line to get their items added so Ajax just headed towards the back of the line. Oh please go ahead, the noble in front of the quickly spotted who he was and was quick to get out the way. The same thing happened over again as Ajax and company jumped to the front of the line. All of the others hoped to increase their value after having him authenticate the item's source. The organizers were more than happy to add their item to the auction. Their audience did seem a little strange to Ajax however, as halfway through a second representative entered. Ajax could see from his clothing that he was of a higher rank than the one currently assisting them. This representative drew attention from the others in the room, but with a simple hand signal, they all ignored him and got back to haggling. 3,000 gold seems like a fair starting bid. The first representative finally finished the agreement with Elijah and Judy. As for our cut, we would take a modest F- dash. This was when the higher-ranked representative stepped in. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance Baron Hearthbound, he bowed slightly towards Ajax. As a thank you for your testimony and a meeting gift, we will lower our cut to 1% of the final price. We do hope that you have a successful run in the upcoming tournament. He's taking part in the tournament, why he can't be older than 35. The employee that had come in carrying the truth stone slowly lost his voice as he figured out what Ajax's participation meant about how strong he was. More frightening was the glare both representatives had locked onto him. Do enjoy your visit to Dark Cavern and this is an entry ticket for you to attend the auction. The representative's voice was a little strained following their employee's outburst, but he maintained a pleasant smile until Ajax and the rest of his family left the room. With his freedom finally gained, Ajax and Lexi took to exploring Dark Cavern on their own. They would have taken Anna with them, but instead she joined Elijah and Judy as they went to scope out the local markets. Unlike a normal city, the tunnels dug by the ants made the underground city have a very different structure to even other dwarven cities. The biggest difference was the complete absence of side streets. All of the houses were built into the side of the tunnels. This meant that, instead of there being a bad side of town there were only tunnels that the locals knew to keep away from unless they wanted trouble. Look what we have here boys. A voice came out from in front as three dwarves approached Ajax and Lexi. A couple foreigners who look like they could use a guide. We'll be happy to offer our services, in exchange for something in return. A voice came from behind the pair as two more dwarves approached. Ajax was quick to identify all of the dwarves, all of them had their levels in the mid to late fifties, certainly impressive for a commoner living in the city, but not enough to pose any sort of threat to him. He casually summoned his sword from his spatial ring, instead of having it come out in his hand, however, he just summoned it on his hip sheath, and all. Frowns followed the appearance of the sword as all five dwarves got into combat position. Despite how young Ajax and Lexi clearly were, Ajax commended them on not underestimating them that much, a lesson that the five had learnt long ago the hard way. 
Ajax finally felt an inspection skill land on him, surprisingly enough it was one he knew well as, Enigma, let him know it was, Judge Threat. Instead of blocking the skill Ajax simply let the skill pass, it wasn't as if it would gather any in-depth information on him. One of the dwarfs froze as dread worked its way over his features, and his skin paled a few shades. Now, now. We don't want this to get ugly in front of the pretty lady. Despite the change in body language, the leader still spoke with a sure-cocked tone. The words however caused the dwarf frozen in fear to move as his head jerked towards his boss with a what the fuck are you doing he'll kill us all expression. H how about w we just lo let them go, boss, the dwarf managed to shakily get out. What are you on about, one of the others shouted, but the leader simply turned and looked at the speaker with a serious yet questioning look. I judge this to be a very bad idea, he said, trying his hardest not to give away what happened, having no idea Ajax already knew. The leader took no time to catch on and quickly course corrected. Actually, it seems that you know exactly where you are going, please have a pleasant evening. Wait a moment. Ajax said as they slowly started backing away, causing them all to freeze as all five had understood the situation. Which way was the auction house? We would hate to miss the start. Ajax was having a bit of fun as he put his hand on the sword handle. The leader was quick to give some very precise directions, before the five quickly got away from the scene. What did you do to them? Lexi asked once they were out of earshot. I didn't do anything. Ajax said as he showed the most innocent expression he could. One of them had, judge threat, so I simply had, enigma, let the skill through. Both had a bit of chuckle at that as they made their way towards the auction house. Chapter 307 Once inside the auction house Ajax had no use for his ticket. Despite them being received as a show of goodwill for his testimony of the steampunk gear Ajax, Lexi, Judy, and Elijah had all been invited to the Goldmancer private balcony. Due to the instability that had been dragged out of Oliver the Archduke was a bit light on people he trusted as far as mercantile people went. Those he did trust he left behind to keep watch over the others. This left him with a space for a few friendly faces, to join him in enjoying the auction. You two finally made it, I was sure it was going to start without you. Ajax was surprised to see the king's oldest son in the room as he was brought in by the attendant. What are you? Lexi left the question unfinished, but it was pretty clear to everyone what the question was. Dad's room has all those nobles in there he and my brother can deal with that, the prince shamelessly said. I can actually enjoy the auction from here. Most of the nobles that had come from the kingdom were actually expected to socialize a little, it had been one of the king's requests in exchange for making the detour that the nobles were not focused as merchants tried to create some favorable connections with the republic. As the sole experienced merchant from his family, this meant that Archduke Goldmancer was allowed to take the opportunity and teach Anna about how to handle auctions in other countries so he was exempt. Ajax was exempted for the very simple reason that it was better for all involved, while he had made great strides in handling social situations he was barely at the point where he could attend any event without unintentionally insulting at least a few participants. Welcome my lords and ladies. The host began the welcoming speech up on the stage only to be silenced as the prince pressed on an enchantment near the glass window. I doubt any of you are interested in the opening speech, the prince said as he retook his seat. Both Elijah and Judy looked like they wanted to complain, neither doing so because the person who drew their ire was a prince, instead they were focused on the presenter and trying to lip-read the welcoming speech hoping to gather any extra information they could about the local situation and any extra tidbit about the items in the list they were given. So what is your impression about Old Whisker? the prince asked Ajax. The question drew more than a few frowns from the goldmancer guards present in the room, despite him being a foreign champion his strength did inspire respect from all of them. He's definitely something else, very scary. Ajax said honestly. Managed to get any information on him? For the first time this evening, the prince lost his joking mood, this time it was the champion of Grinder asking the question, not the aloof prince who threw away his position as heir. Don't worry the room is secure. Ajax took another short look around before he answered the question. He's got a legendary inspection skill, 
high level too. If he wanted to, he could break right through, Enigma, and take a look at any part of my status. At least he could before Ajax chose the upgrade to provide a reinforced defense to the more guarded sections of his status, though he kept the part about the upgrade to himself. He didn't take a look at anything that others haven't already gotten, but he could have. Ajax continued to calm down his family and friends, who were surprised at the reveal. His defense to being inspected is much lower quality, I would guess it's a high uncommon or a middle-of-the-way rare. From the way you knew who I was talking about I am guessing you got his name. What else? The prince nodded. He is a lethal threat to me, level 209, there were a few sharp breaths drawn in at that, but the prince didn't seem surprised in the least. And he is 679 years old. That last remark caused both the archduke and the prince to stare at him with wide eyes. You're sure about that? The both asked at the same time, sparing a small glance at each other for a split second before focusing on Ajax once more. I'm sure. Ajax confirmed. Why does that matter? Because the Republic has been leaking out that he is closer to 900, Archduke Goldmancer answered. If he is only 679 years old, and looks as old as he does, that means he doesn't have as much time left as a deterrent as they want, it does explain why they are so interested in you and your succession as the war deterrent. I'll let father know, but other than that the information doesn't leave this room, by royal command. The prince unleashed his aura to punctuate those words, and everyone in the room felt the pressure. The solemn air in the room was dispersed as the opening speech ended and the auction began in truth. The prince returned to his relaxed, carefree state and the silent enchantment on the glass was turned off. The items being auctioned off were a solid mix of actually useful items, items meant for vanity and prestige as well as curiosities obtained from one of the other kingdoms. While none of the items were anything Ajax was especially interested in he found himself in awe of what he was seeing. From the start of the auction 15 items had gone by and there was only one that the Archduke hadn't made a bet on, that item had been won by Kind Grinder. On every other item brought up the Archduke had been very active, despite all that he didn't win a single item. This might seem like a poor showing to the untrained eye, but both Elijah and Judy were looking at him like they wanted to ask for his autograph, but didn't dare disturb him while he was working. Ajax assumed that he had already raised the princes on the items he had been active on by 30 to 40 percent. The Archduke was so good that Ajax was at the same time thankful for the chance to see him in action, but also a little worried, he silently promised himself to leave this balcony before the end of the auction so that nobody would associate him with the raised prices. That's the one you put up, what's it do? Anna asked as the half-mask with an eye was brought out, this was also the first of the steampunk items. What do you mean what's it do? The prince interjected before Ajax got a chance to answer. Some of the items were still usable. Lexi said with a smirk as she brought out the steampunk leg started the steam process, and caused it to jerk, with a small eclectic pulse, at the connection. Depending on how damaged they were, some are still usable as prosthetics, with a bit of a learning curve. Ajax did his best, to ignore the dumbfounded look on the prince's face, and answered. No idea what the eye is good for, I wouldn't try attaching that since messing up has a good chance to kill the wearer. The lower portion however, should be some kind of filtration system, for gases, and poisons. Whoa there, back up. Some of the things there might still work. The prince was still catching up. Is there anything in the pile that me or Shadow had that might be very useful? Uh, I think so. Ajax said as he thought back through any of the things they had taken for anything that might be useful. That connected suit from the mini-boss who didn't fully replace anything on his body. You took off his head, so I think the suit should still be whole and functional. What's so good about that suit? The prince asked. Not sure how long it can keep going since you killed the boss, pretty quick. Ajax answered. But since it's an exoskeleton with all four limbs and chest connection with the steam engine on the back it should be usable by anyone. Not only that, but it would increase anyone's physical capacity up to a level 65 physical fighter. That's very good for an enchanted piece of gear, the prince exclaimed. It does have some drawbacks. Ajax warned him. 
when not powered up, it should be quite heavy. Not only that, but you saw how this gear works, much better at short burst releases of power than continued use. That's true, their opening attacks were a lot deadlier than anything else they had, the prince nodded as he pondered the suit in question. I hope that thing still works, my niece wanted to be a mage, but with those extra stats she got from your training method, the extra weight shouldn't be that much of a problem. Ajax was very much surprised to see his grandfather enter a bidding war for a small ruby gemstone. I know someone looking for one of those back home, it'll bring us quite a bit of profit. Elijah's smile didn't show that he had spent over 40,000 gold coins on a single rock. Okay kid come on time to move. The prince started to lead Ajax and Lexi towards the door. This thing is almost over, and the last time I came out from the same balcony as old Goldmancer, I had to spend five parties, mending fences with the nobility in that city. Chapter 308 Ajax was mentally exhausted by the end of the night. The prince had managed to spare him and Lexi the wrath of the nobles who lost their money to Archduke Goldmancer's schemes. He did so by taking them to the king's balcony, where they were exposed more than a few nobles. What Ajax had lost in willpower that evening, however, his grandfather's people had managed to gain in terms of alchemy reagents. Having left the kingdom of Grinder, Ajax now had access to some different common reagents than the ones he was used to for alchemy. The idea of trying out new recipes all the way to the next dungeon filled him with energy. It had already been a month since the convoy left Grinder, by the time that they made it to the next dungeon, and this was their first mail stop. Any non-emergency mail was going to be coming for everyone that was part of the convoy, and with the amount of nobles here, most would be getting an update on their estates or families. All Ajax got was an in-depth update from his mother and father about how his niece was growing up and how Tom and Kate were keeping on top of their responsibilities. Even with such mundane information it had been a long ten-page letter that had come. Elijah, Aurora, and Judy got a whole stack of papers from Alana and Sylvia, who had remained in charge back in the kingdom. It seems that the massive gap that formed in the market from the absence of everyone who had left wasn't something they had appropriately planned for, and now they were playing catch-up. Their planning issue thankfully was one of oversaturation of the market, while still a screw-up it was something easily overcome by simply not selling at the current prices and waiting for the market to pick back up. It would mean that they would be left with a lot less liquid capital than they would have liked, but the situation was manageable, which it is why it was a non-priority mail. It's been decades since the last tournament we took part in. Aurora let out a sigh. We only looked at the market changes after the last tournament held, but since we didn't take part in that one we didn't account for the amount of crafters that would be leaving or losing their customers. At least we know we aren't the only ones to make this mistake. Almost everyone else reacted the same. Elijah let out a breath. Ajax come on, they finally caved, and they are going to let us take a look. Lexi burst into the small boxy room on top of the worm. Really? I'm coming too. Judy was quick to join up, even Ajax dropped the preparations he was making for his next potion and headed out. The main attraction of the auction, and the one item that Ajax was disappointed not to see being auctioned off from the Goldmancer balcony had been a griffin egg. Much like the salamander egg he had helped House Silvertongue secure way back when this one had a very high chance of hatching, the hatchling would then have a high chance of bonding the person who raised it. Unlike the salamander however the griffin was not only an almost exclusively combat bond, it also doubled as a flying mount, making it one of the best choices out there. The winner of the very heated finale to the evening had been House Steelblade. It had cost them a substantial sub of 150k gold, but Benedict's cousin and fellow tournament competitor had recently had his bonded fox pass away and was in prime age to pick up a baby griffin that would all but surely last him the remainder of his life. You all got here so quick. Benedict teased them as Lexi, Anna, Judy, and Ajax all arrived at the carriage that now exclusively housed Benedict's cousin and the egg. Make sure you all clamp down on your mana emission, there should be no leakage. Surrounding the eggs in their mana was something that a lot of monsters did, griffins being among their numbers, it had also been heavily researched that following the same pattern after obtaining the egg by the one who is looking to bond it increases the chance of a bond forming by 30%. 
Despite there being no tests done to see what happens if multiple different types of mana were used to surround the egg, nobody was willing to risk their investment and good luck by allowing others to leave their mana around it. The egg in question was much bigger than the salamander egg Ajax had seen, while the salamander egg had been the size of an ostrich egg this one was easily four times as big. More than that this egg wasn't red in color, it was instead a silvery gray, and it stood nestled against Benedict's cousin. Ajax could feel the mana surrounding the egg, this time, however, he had more than a few skills he didn't have last time he saw an egg and was quick to put them to good use. Inspector's eye was quickly used and the information it brought was quite good. Name, Swiftwing Griffin Egg. Level, Not Applicable. Age, 12 Months. Hatchling, Healthy. Incubation Time Left, 1 Month. Alchemical Uses, Strong Mana Catalyst, Unstable Mana Catalyst, High Quality Sample. How long is he going to stay with the egg like that? Ajax asked as it seemed rather uncomfortable. For as much time as he can until it hatches. Benedict answered. Apparently it was retrieved four months ago, so he's got a good long while. At least our appraisers tell us it's a viable egg. Ajax had to bite his cheek to not let it slip that it only had a month to go. Despite the friendship he had developed with Benedict, it wasn't as close as his connection with House Goldmancer or Mana Shaper. This meant that he wasn't willing to reveal his high-tier inspection skill on something so irrelevant. There are more than one type of griffin? Ajax asked instead. There are. This one is a swift wing. Benedict confirmed. How did you know? Alchemist's examination, Ajax answered, it was something he didn't mind people knowing he had and provided a good cover. It's also a strong mana catalyst, an unstable mana catalyst, as well as a high-quality ingredient. That is not an ingredient. Everyone present had joined in on that, if not all for the same reason. While Benedict, his cousin, and Lexi were all outraged at the idea of using a potential baby griffin as part of a fancy omelet, and calling it alchemy Anna and Judy were outraged on having something that costs 150k gold be used as part of an experiment in a fancy omelet hoping it would turn out well. Come on now, don't look at me like that, I'm just telling you what the skill told me. Even Ajax wasn't that wasteful as to actually use something so expensive in one of his alchemy projects. More than that, however Ajax very much wanted to find a bond for himself and from the looks of things it seemed that raising one from a baby might just be his only choice as his power was starting to dwarf anything he could find wandering humanoid areas. Are you bringing it into the dungeon? Yes. Benedict's cousin confirmed. The prince offered to safeguard it and keep it isolated from outside mana while I fight. Fortunately, or unfortunately depending on how you look at it, the delve that took place over the next three days was nothing out of the ordinary. With a level difference of 18 between floors even Ajax had only managed to gain a stat boost for three floors. One of the only highlights of the delve was that the second floor had been a feeder floor and the group had managed to grab a rather sizable amount of meat and fur. The animal in question seemed to be a giant version of chinchilla, as far as Ajax could tell. While he wasn't keen on eating the giant rodent, he was forced to admit that it had some of the softest fur he had ever felt and made sure to skin as many of them as he could before they left that floor. With the second dungeon cleared and no other reason for a detour the convoy finally started heading towards the capital where the last two dungeons awaited and the tournament was getting closer with each passing day.